Welcome to Hornbill TV's Prime Time with Elguli, ladies and gentlemen. So there it is, the 14 Nagaland Legislative Assembly for you. The Governor of Nagaland swore in the Council of Ministers today in Kohima. Most of the old war horses are still there taking charge of the castle. But the focus here is the new fresh-faced generals in the force, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some, some people had been uh, rooting for a lot of new faces in the Council of Ministers, and I think most of them are there. For example, Jacob Zimomi, yes, he is also there. He has finally got a ministerial birth, finally. The Eastern communities have yet again found serious favor in the eyes of Nifirio. They have now not one or two, but three legislators in the Council of Ministers. They are Pai Wang Kunyak, C. L. John, and Pashang Mongba Chang. Also, yes, there is Salhao Chunyo Kruse, who has become the first female minister in Naglin. Uh, it was expected that Jacob Zimomi would find a place in the Council of Ministers this time, and there he is. He got it finally. So congratulations to him. The next excitement now is what his portfolio uh, would be considering the heavy speculations earlier that Yan Tengo Patan and Zimomi reportedly were in a race for the post of Deputy Chief Minister. But of course, the BJP's national spokesperson, uh, Nalin Kohli, had made clear earlier that Patan would remain the Deputy Chief Minister. So to solve the problem, we have now two Deputy Chief Ministers. All the best to our new government leaders. Here are the top stories of Tuesday. For the first time in the history of Nagaland Legislative Assembly, Nagaland will be having two deputy chief ministers. The 14th Nagaland Legislative Assembly has been sworn in today in Kohima with nine ministers, including the first female minister for Nagaland. For the first time in the history of Nagaland Legislative Assembly, Nagaland will be having two deputy chief ministers, ladies and gentlemen. The governor of Nagaland has appointed Yan Tengo Patan and T. R. Ziliang as deputy chief ministers. While Patan retains his position, this is a full circle for former chief minister T. R. Ziliang, the friend turned foe turned friend again for Nifirio. Some of you might be asking if you can have two chief ministers in a state and specifically in a small state like Nagaland. Well, I may have to disappoint you here. No, you can't have two chief ministers just yet, but you can certainly have two or even three or even more, four or even five deputy chief ministers. No, I, I'm not pulling your surprise legs here. Actually, having multiple deputy chief ministers is not a new thing in India except for Nagaland. Actually, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, it has five deputy chief ministers and Uttar Pradesh has two deputy chief ministers. So if you are surprised, don't be surprised now. Other than that, no other states and union territories have more than one deputy chief minister in office. Of course, now Nagaland has two. The 14th Nagaland Legislative Assembly has been sworn in today in Kohima with nine ministers, including the first female minister for Nagaland, ladies and gentlemen, led by Chief Minister Nifirio and Deputy Chief Ministers Yantungo Patan and T. R. Ziliang. The governor has instated nine ministers in a swearing in ceremony, which Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi also attended. The new ministers to lead the state are seniors. Uh, G. Kaito Aye, Jacob Zimomi, of course, K. G. Kenye, P. Paiwang Konyak, Mitsubu Jamir again, Tamjanimna Along again, C. L. John, 
and of course the first female minister and one of the two first female MLAs from Nagaland, Salhao Tunyo Kruse, and then we have newcomer P. Pashang Mungba Chang. The new ministers in the council are Jacob Zimomi, who made electoral history recently by sweeping the Gaspani One Assembly constituency by taking more than 55 percent of votes at 32,037 votes from the constituency. Then there is the former advisor C. L. John and of course Cruce again who is now officially the first female minister from Nagaland and of course again there is Pashang Mongba Pom making his maiden entry into NLA. Right now there are no clear indications that the chief minister has allocated portfolios to his new ministers and advisors. Uh, however it is expected that a list in this regard to their assignments would be decided on and released soon. Hornbill TV will be bringing you new updates in this regard. So let's wish our new government the best. Let's check out the next news. Religious politics in India is like spurious alcohol, especially when they often get mixed in communal glasses. A mosque in Aligarh in Uttar Pradesh has been covered with a tarbulin before the festival of Holi. This, according to reports, uh, is to ensure that the place of worship is not smeared with color. Uh, Abdul Karim Majid in Aligarh has been covered with a tarbulin at night so that it is not smeared with colors during the Hindu festival of Holi. It is said that the action was taken based on instructions from the police administration to maintain peace and order. The report also said this is not the first time actually that the authorities have employed the same preventive method. In fact, this has been the practice from during the past few years during celebrations of Holi. The mosque is located at a very sensitive area. That's what we heard. Meghalaya has a new government led by familiar faces this time, of course, Konrad Sangma. The National People's Party Chief Konrad Sangma took oath as the state's chief minister earlier, along with 11 others, including two deputy chief ministers, took oath on Tuesday. Sangma is making history for the government as he leads the government for the second consecutive term for the state. Sangma and his colleagues took oath in the presence of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Shillong. Meghalaya Governor uh, Chauhan administered the oath to the 12th member council of ministers including NPP's President Tin Song. Tin Song and Sniawop Lang Thar took oath as deputy chief ministers. 58 newly elected members of the Meghalaya Assembly took oath on Monday with pro tem speaker Timothy D. Shera administering the oath of office and secrecy to the representatives the, uh, uh, for the event. The chief of the National People's Party, uh, Konrad K. Sangma, was also at a ceremony earlier. Meghalaya has 60 assembly seats, but polling in the Soihong constituency was deferred after the demise of UDP nominee HDR Lingto earlier. Senior MLAs who took oath as members of the assembly included Sangma and Priston Tinsung of the NPP. The TMC's Mukul Sangma and Medpa Lingto of the UDP were also there. A special session of the assembly was convened for the swearing-in ceremony of the newly elected MLAs. The 14th Nagaland Legislative Assembly is now in place officially and a new team of government leaders have been sworn in. Now amid all the excitement and drama since the election results were declared on March 2nd, there in the back of your head has been this worrying question. Will Nagaland get another opposition-less government this time too? Hornbill TV has been following and exploring conversations in that regard for some time now. Uh, will there be another opposition-less government again uh, like we had previously in 2015 and 2021? Uh, the NDPP-BJB alliance together won 37 seats out of 60 seats in the uh, Nagaland Legislative Assembly. 
Now all the chairs in the Council of Ministers have been filled. Nine ministers in the cabinet, 28 will be those in the advisory layer of the government. So what happens to the 23 legislatures from other parties, NCP, NPP, NPF, JDU, and of course the RPI and the independents, what happens to them if every seat in the council is filled and there is no place for them in the advisory layer of the government? Well, um, let's examine this. There are approximately only 43 government departments in Nagaland that just won't do for the MLS, all the MLS. Of course, there are a number of state ventures and public sector undertakings but that just won't rock and roll for the small party MLAs because power and politics are not for people with simple ambitions. Let's just leave it at that for now. So even if the six non-alliance groups and the NDPP and BJB decide on an oppositionless system, there just won't be enough left of the cake for them to have a slice each and i believe that both the ndpp and the bjb are clear about that element there is just too high the potential that conflict will slowly emerge at the dinner table because there are just too few dishes for everyone to eat even from a political point of view ladies and gentlemen of course more allies means more assurance that is true uh, there wouldn't be any troublemakers if there are more partners in the alliance but this peace and assurance has to be bought with something right meaning the more the people at the table the more the chances that the dishes will run out before resentment and divisions appear maybe not now but eventually Second point, let's take a hypothetical scenario here. Assuming that they join the alliance and establish networks within the parties, the NDPP and the BJB will already have competition, not from outside, but from within. That is dangerous, remember that. When division and conflict start, it will be much easier for the non-alliance parties to forge a different alliance than it will be for the NDPP BJP coalition. Uh, if you can read up on the history of political alliances and the culture of coalition politics in India, and it will give you a very clear idea why the threat is not from outside but from within. That is why coalition politics are very fragile and sensitive. So we we all have seen it in India. So simply put. For time constraints on this show, you have 21 non-alliance parties who need only 11 MLAs to form their own government if things start going south. The BJP wants to protect itself from this. This is what I believe. This is what the BJP spokesperson Nalin Kohli may have had in mind when he reportedly told the media yesterday that the BJP will just want to stick with the NDPP. During briefings yesterday on the next deputy chief minister, he was reported as having refuted speculations of forging alliances with other parties. And that he said, there he, he was reported to have said, there was only one alliance, that is the NDPP and the BJP alliance. There had been hints here and there about this entire opposition-less government issue before and since the results were announced. The smaller political parties including the NCP had earlier uh, expressed support to the alliance in one way or the other. The NCP won seven seats, NPP five. LJB Ram Vilas faction, Naga People's Front and the RPI two seats each. There is one JDU or MLA, yes, and of course there are the four independents who want seats. In other words, as I've already said earlier, while the NDPP and the BJP is not surrounded by best friends, yes, they aren't also exactly surrounded by toxic enemies either. Almost all of them have had political relationships in various states and in other in one way or the other in the past. It is also true that there are no permanent political enemies and friends, yes. But as far as the question of opposition-less government is concerned, for now, we will have to hold Nalin Kohli to his statement. Even if there is still an outside support, let me remind you that pressure and dissatisfaction will sooner or later gradually force the small parties into becoming the opposition. Why? The reason is very simple. Because politics is a high-stakes game where 
ambition for power is the only central element to political success. Whether you are a big MLA or small MLA, it doesn't matter. Those were the top news speaks of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Leave your feedback in the comment section if you're on social media and watching this and tell us what your aspirations and expectations from the new Naglin government are. Hornbill TV will be back with more news for you later on. You are the best. I'm Al Nguli. See you next time.